St Nicholas, Little Brackstead, Essex, to the casual passerby, the church appears to be nothing exceptional. A simple Norman-style structure, it has served the farming community a mile east of Whitham since at least 1120. Plans to celebrate its 900th anniversary in 2020 have had to be postponed because of the coronavirus pandemic. Today, the tiny church in the shadow of a rural business park has a monthly congregation of 18. Despite its appearance, St Nicholas's draws visitors from around the world. The reason is to be found inside the building, where there is a unique display of religious decorations and furnishings. The creator of the artworks was the distinguished Victorian rector, the Reverend Ernest Geldart, the parish priest from 1881 until he retired in 1900. Dr. James Betley is an architectural historian. He has studied the life and works of the Reverend Geldart. So what were the circumstances that brought the Reverend Geldart to Little Braxted? Well, he came here in 1881. Ten years before that, he was actually training to be an architect. He was not destined, as it were, to, to be a clergyman at all. Uh, but he was working in London, and something obviously happened to make him change direction in life. So he became a, a priest, and after a couple of uh, curacies in London and then in Surrey, he was looking around for something more permanent. And through his uh, contacts that he'd made in London, he knew the rector of Willingale Doe, which is a parish the other side of Chelmsford from here. And the rector there met a man named Duquesne. His brother, as it so happened, was the patron of the living here at Little Braxted. So when Little Braxted came up, uh, his friend Duquesne knew about it, tipped him off, and um, at first he wasn't very keen to come here because it was only uh, it only paid 120 pounds a year, which was not in, really enough to to support him. Um, but he obviously relented, and the next thing we know is he's turning up with his friend Duquesne to inspect the church and the rectory, and then on Easter Day, executed in the church by the bishop. What, what sort of contribution did he make? to the church itself. The contribution he made to the church is, is absolutely enormous and although it's, it's only a, a small church, a very small church, um, the sort of proportion, proportional change that he made to the building um, was almost total. Very little on the outside, certainly as you approach the church from the road it looks almost exactly as it would have looked uh, when Geldart himself first saw it but you walk round the back and you see the north aisle and the vestry that he added. And then when you come through the door, then you fully appreciate um, the changes that he, that he made to the building. He came here in 1881. The sort of major changes were in 1884, and it would have taken him that long, really, to, to build up the funds to do what he wanted to do. And of course you have to remember that he had this architectural training and as well as being a parish priest, he was also working quite actively on other churches and indeed secular buildings. He was very much working as an architect alongside his, his parish duties. This is one of the three large Wall paintings that Geldart introduced into the church in 1885, and it's a way of depicting the Apostles' Creed, which was quite common in the Middle Ages, this, this format. And the Creed, of course, is the basic statement of Christian belief. 
and he writes about it in his little book on the church and he says so the story goes that they the apostles wrote it each apostle giving one piece beginning with St Peter and there's St Peter up at the top left with the opening words I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and then he goes on to say I don't know if they did each say those words but I'm quite sure of this that if the twelve apostles came into this church with us now they would say yes this is our belief and it was very important for the particularly the high church clergy at the time that we're speaking of that they could trace their origins all the way back to the apostles through what was called the apostolic succession so this this picture has the, the greatest significance for Geldart and that's why it's placed so centrally in the church for everyone to see. How do you think his parishioners reacted to what he was doing? Because he was making significant changes. He was making very significant changes. Some of them seemed terribly, um, not exactly trivial to us, but things that we now take for granted. I mean, the very first service that he conducted here, he, he introduced the idea of taking a weekly collection, which was something that had normally only happened once a year, weekly Holy Communion, again, which is something that normally had only happened two or three times a year. And this, this seems perhaps strangest to us now. He had lighted candles on the altar, because at that time there was a very strong view that you should only light candles if you actually needed them to provide light. So a morning service, you wouldn't normally have lighted candles, but this was something that, that was part of his, his doctrine, and he introduced lighted candles at his very first service. Just along the top there, you can see there's an inscription in Latin, which was composed by Geldart himself, and it's, it's one of uh, four texts in various places around the church, each of them different, uh, and each of them sort of relevant to their location. But if you look carefully on this one, you can see that some of the letters have little dots underneath them, and on other inscriptions, some of the letters are bigger than others. And the letters that are marked out in this way are letters that are Roman numerals, so C, M, L, I, V, so on. And if you take those letters that equate to numerals and add them all up, they all come to 1884, 1884, which was the year in which he completed the major part of his, his decoration and alteration of the church. It's a very clever thing to be able to do and must have taken many, many hours um, in, in, in the rectory of an evening. I think the parishioners accepted what he was doing. But I understand that not everybody appreciated what he was doing. No. Um, there was, you have to go back a little bit, 1874, Public Worship Regulation Act, when conduct of church services was regulated, not just by custom, but by law. And if you did certain things, like the use of incense, for example, uh, you were actually breaking the law and one or two clergymen actually went to prison as a result and they became martyrs for the cause. Seems incredible now really. Um, and there, there was a, a, an organisation called the Protestant Association which uh, actively sought out clergy who were uh, indulging in what they, they thought of as uh, papist uh, ritual and activities in their churches and uh, Geldart was one of those on their on their hit list as well and there were people in Whittam you know Whittam about a mile away from here but if you're in Little Braxted that seemed you know it's the other side of the river um, uh, and they would they would come and attend services and they would sit at the back and sort of think imagine them taking notes and then they would write to the local press and um, Geldart was the victim of a considerable press campaign, and um, in, in the in the later in the 1880s, he was actually uh, threatened with with prosecution for 
some of the things that he was doing uh, in the church here, such as celebrating Holy Communion with his back to the congregation, for example, the so-called eastward position where you're facing the altar rather than facing the, the congregation. And yes, I mean, this caused him a lot of stress. It caused him in 1892 actually to think of, of retiring, of resigning uh, from the parish altogether. But his, 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 um, his parishioners did, did back him in um, 1885 uh, when there were a lot of complaints in, in the press. Uh, he writes in his diary, my church wardens both take a homely but sensible view of the case to wit, what business is it of people at Braintree or Brentwood what we do here? in which sentiment I heartily concur. He just wanted to be able to get on with, with, with what he was doing. And in, in parish terms, he was quite successful. He built up the congregation, had many, many more communicants at the end of his time here than at the beginning. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm standing in the pulpit, which was decorated by Geldart and from which he preached. And in the window beside it, he couldn't really see it, but of course the congregation could. He put this picture of uh, St. John the Baptist, and the text round the top uh, reads, The voice of one crying in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord. And I just wonder if Geldar, he did have a good sense of humour, and I wondered if he saw himself a bit as, uh, as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and whether he regarded as uh, Little Braxton, this rather rural backwater as being a bit of a wilderness. Who knows? What do you think his legacy is when we look back now? It's difficult to say because so much of his work, so much of his decorative work has been lost over the years just through deterioration or because uh, it was actively painted over. He's very well known in high church circles. He's still talked about Father Geldart in rather reverent terms. Um, but there aren't, there aren't many places where you can go to where you can get a really good idea of, of what he was about. Little Braxted is the main, the main place to come. I mean, for me, his importance is that he combined the careers of priest and architect, designer. So that the church work that he was doing has this sort of added dimension, if you like. It is very much an expression of his faith. Uh, you know, for example, he believed very much, and he wrote, he wrote a little book about the church here, explaining all the decorations and so on. And um, in that he, he says, God's house ought to be the finest house and the most beautiful house in a parish. And that is, that is what, he was, that he, what he was striving to achieve. And not just through, through what you see, but music was a very important part of it. Um, Incense comes into it for all sorts of reasons. So you've got, you've got sight, you've got sound, you've got smell, all, all the senses really uh, being engaged by the, by the congregation. Would you say that uh, St. Nicholas Church is unique then in, in this respect? There are very few other churches that are decorated to quite this extent. And I don't think there is another one that has that same sort of personal imprint. You know, this was the one place where he had total control because being the rector, he had the last word on what happened inside the church. He was the client, he was the designer, he was to a certain extent the Craftsman. I mean, the, the, some of the, the paintings here he did with his own hand. Some of the objects he stonework he carved himself. And I don't think you'd find anywhere else that they all come together in in one man and are therefore an expression of what he believed, as well as being 
an example of his creative skill. Reverend Geldart's poor health, which plagued him all his life, continued to deteriorate. And in 1900, he decided to retire and moved with his wife and daughter to Surrey. Relieved of the stress and responsibilities of parish life, his health improved and he lived until he was 81. The Reverend Geldart died on July the 11th, 1929, and is buried in the churchyard at Hatchford in Surrey, beneath the impressive cross he designed. His obituary in the Times described him as an authority on church architecture. <laughs>